Hey everyone, I am so excited to have you here. I am starting our new program called Ask an Expert. And today I have a very special guest with us. This is Dr. Terry Silkman. I am down here at the VCA at Jordan Valley, Jordan, Jordan River. Jordan River. Jordan yeah, River. Hospital. It's VCA now, which is amazing. And I just tell us a little bit about how did you get involved in being a vet? Tell us okay. a little bit about you. Well, I, I, first off, uh, I'm happy to be here. And second, you would not be the first person who's confused us with the human hospital that's just about <laughs> a mile up the road. Uh, there is a Jordan Valley Hospital, and I do not work there. I work in, I work in the, in the, in the four-legged industry. So um, it's, it's somewhat a circuitous uh, venture. Um, you know Elka because mm -hmm. we've talked, and I'll be brief about it, but started my life uh, farming. That's what I thought I was going to do forever. And... 20% uh, interest rates and a few hailstorms and freezes at the wrong time decided I was going to do something different. So at about 30 uh, in the sense of, you know, because I know some of you are entrepreneurial and I guess I would say never shy away from your dream. So at 30 with three small kids and a wife, we packed up and had no idea that uh, I would be able to uh, get the accomplishments or the, the criteria for veterinary medicine done, let alone uh, get accepted. But all of that happened uh, and that was close to 30 years ago now. Veterinary medicine has been for me an enormously gratifying, rewarding career. Uh, it's led me to places uh, and things that I would have never had the opportunity to do otherwise. Still have a, a great passion for an industry that I think any of you who were interested in going that track, there are probably not very many prospective veterinarians on here, but uh, don't pay attention to all the negative stuff out there. Uh, I've found, uh, you know, coming out with huge obligations and no resource that this uh, was a profession that could reward us well and could move forward. Uh, actually, there are several others. Uh, one that uh, Elka and I have a, a shared interest in, in the sense of uh, some of the other things we'll talk about shortly. But um, that's, I, I hope, gives you some perspective. Uh, we've uh, worked in the area where. Um, a fair bit of techie stuff has uh, has fallen our way. That's kind of my personality anyway. I like doing things like joint replacements and back surgery things and cancer therapy, things that unfortunately have required a lot of cure. Um, and, and, and it takes a lot to do that. It takes a lot from the client to do that. So one of the things that I have found in this journey is the value of prevention, the value of looking at some things that everybody can do in a way that is extremely cost effective and extremely effective. I guess what I tell people in multiple areas that I work in now is the best way to deal with disease is to uh, prevent it before you put a name on it, not to cure it after you put a name on it. Do you so, guys hear that? Prevention. It's so, all about prevention. It's, and I'm going to assume you have fur babies, right? We do. Oh, we have, tell yep. us a little bit about your fur we babies. We do. Our latest one was, was uh, well, at, at the stage we're at, we, we travel and we do a lot of other things uh, for several ventures that we work with. And I'd thought at some point that probably once our last pet uh, went to heaven that we might not do another one, but we uh, had an opportunity to stop in at the hospital about a year and a half ago, and as it happened, there were a uh, batch of standard poodle puppies coming in for their first set of shots, and I went back and took a look at a few things in the back, and when I came back out, Lucy was uh, on my wife's shoulder, and she's a little over a year and a half now, old standard poodle. Uh, we've got all kinds of Facebook. In fact, she has her own Facebook thing, Dr. Terry and Lucy. Uh, and, oh, you've got to find that. And, I'll, I'll put that in the comments after, too. And uh, we show her doing training things and all kinds of things that she does with us. She's just been uh, a real spark of joy in our lives. Uh, you know, probably of all the pets that I've had, she's definitely one of the most personable and one of the most engaging that we've ever had. And what's your page's name again? It's Dr. Terry and Lucy. Oh my gosh, you guys have got to go find that after this. Well, I'm very excited to have you. I am so appreciative that you've sacrificed your time today to let me ask him, I'm going to ask him, the top 10 questions that I get as a Pottery Pet Pro, I get a lot of questions from pet parents that aren't necessarily nutritional questions. And so I'm very excited to be able to have Terry here. So we're gonna go ahead and dive in now that we know a little bit about him. And for those of you that don't know me, my name is Elka Bostwick. I am a first star vice president pet pro with Pottery. Woo, 
It's quite a title. And wow. I am very excited to be sitting here with Terry, Dr. Terry Silkman today. Hello, Kelly. Hello, Christine. We are going to dive right in. So the number one, one of the questions that I get is, how do I prevent dental disease? Well, it, it, it's such a huge issue. Uh, you know, and I guess uh, I, I'm just working a couple of days a week uh, as uh, a doctor here now uh, because of the other interests we have. But Monday and Tuesday, we took over 30 teeth uh, out of three different dogs. And that's such a traumatic event uh, for the pet and for the owner, uh, but, but obviously for the pet. And most owners don't have uh, a real good handle on this because pets are so stoic and they're so tough as to the degree of pain that they're going through before that happens. And, and so the question is, well, what's going to happen when I take all these teeth out in terms of all the discomfort and all the distress that the pet's going through? And while that's a consideration, I would say for any of us who've had a toothache, uh, multiply that times six or eight or ten at a level that you would have never tolerated uh, because we would whine and go get it fixed way before our pets can do that. There isn't much that an owner is going to be able to see in terms of advancing dental disease that they're going to be able to evaluate. The pets are going to find a way not to starve. They're going to find a way to power down the food. They're going to find a way to drink the water even though when they do, that cold water hitting that tooth probably shoots the pain up the side of the face the same way as it does for you and I <sighs> trying to chew kibble. In fact, you'll see some pets that just swallow it whole and owners will kind of see that. So uh, there's probably no area of veterinary medicine that is more useful in the sense of not just preserving a quality of life but a quantity of life than tooth care and and so I'm given a lot of perspective but it's a huge issue and in terms of prevention obviously the 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 real the straightforward answer would be well if we could brush the teeth and floss the teeth and those kinds of things that would be the thing to do and in larger dogs it seems like there's some facial tolerance uh, mechanism in, in bigger <laughs> dogs that isn't there for little dogs. So in big dogs, uh, even hyper big dogs like a Labrador or even a Rottweiler or a, a, even a Chow a lot of the time will sit there and let you brush their teeth pretty effectively. And, and I would say of all the things I could recommend to an owner, there is nothing that replaces good brushing. Uh, Got to be careful about the toothpaste. The ones that we use have this label that say don't swallow more than a, a little mm -hmm. bit. And I'm curious as to why we use that on our teeth. But anyway, there are good veterinary toothpaste. One, one of them is Verback. Um, Verback is you can find it usually at your local veterinarian as well as online. But it's a company called Verback, and that's the that's what I use for cedar mm -hmm. is Verback. And and there is a video that you can find on our on our page of me just doing that, brushing cedar's teeth. Yeah. During February, we did a thing on National Dental Month. So yeah. Very very, very intuitive. Yeah, and and on um, I, I believe on Lucy's page, we actually have a uh, detoxification uh, 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 thing. You know, because of all the oral stuff uh, that has zeolite and activated charcoal and chlorophyll in it. Yes. It's a powder that we can you can just dip the toothbrush in a oh, wet toothbrush awesome. and. You can use that on their teeth. It's safe to swallow, and if they do swallow it, it's not just neutral. It actually, it's a detox that... I'll have to get some samples uh, from I, you. I, I, I want to use that on cedar. I believe, and I'm not sure whether we have license to uh, advertise for products or not. I know you <laughs> did just one, but there is a pet food company that actually uses this same detoxification formula in one of their kidney diets, and, and for obvious reasons. Is reason. it an enzyme? Well... That removes the biofilm? No, 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 no. There, there are okay. those as well. This is just a straight... It, it, it's, it's a detox uh, product. Uh, it has those three ingredients in powdered form. Okay. And it's not, you know, I know the enzyme products you're talking about, multiple ones out right. there. No, this is just a straight detoxification okay. uh, thing. But it appears that, again, that, that combination of the activated charcoal and the zeolite and stuff actually complex with the plaque and the tartar the same way as they, as they would with toxic gut things. Awesome. And, and if you'll send me some information, I'll post it in the links after the live in the next, you know, in the next 24, 48 hours. Um, I'd love to look into it, and I'm sure the viewers would too. So, so yeah, yeah, it's 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 not labeled for that at all. Right. Uh, totally off label, but we actually found in some people that used it uh, that they it, we, it worked pretty well for some people as a natural tooth whitener and things like awesome. that. So that's that's kind of where I always looking. Sounds for, like me and Cedar are going to be brushing it yeah. up later. We're going to so, do it together. <laughs> so always looking for an opportunity to yeah. try to help people do a better job again in the sense of what it provides if they do swallow it. It's mm -hmm. You know, well, I guess I would say if you have a pet that's suffering from a 
toxic problem, something like a diabetes or a kidney failure or a liver failure type thing where you're worried about toxic stuff, just as a standalone detox type thing to add to the food, there are lots out there. And as I said, there is a very reputable food company who is using that as a prescription in awesome. one of their kidney diets at this awesome. point. Awesome. Okay. No, that's awesome. And um, any, what about like all those other treats and stuff mm. that are out there? Do you so, recommend any of those as preventative care? So, cares? yeah, we're giving you guys kind of long answers. That's, that's sort okay. of my way. But, uh, <laughs> But yeah, there are, uh, uh, Elka just mentioned some of the enzyme products, and I think some of those things can be fairly effective. A lot of the common treat type things that you would see that are, what shall I say, purported to be tooth care products probably really aren't extremely effective. I'm not going to single any of them out. but And there's a when, lot of them that are high calorie too, yeah, that pack and, on and, the pounds, which is the, super dangerous Right, and, and so when you look at something that crunches up and gets right at the apex of the tooth, well, almost anything can take the calculus or the tartar off the apex of the tooth. What you would be looking for is something that actually would slide up the tooth almost like a squeegee and before it fell apart and, and get the plaque off the teeth. And of course, once it becomes tartar, uh, that, that nothing works that way except uh, coming in for the dental cleaning yep. and polishing. But Genetics and bad luck play a big yeah, part in, sure. in you know, pets' oral health as well. So that's kind of a kind of a big thing too. So there are there are some really great things out there that, that actually I would say for any of you in terms of now a Reader's Digest version of all of this information. <laughs> one, if you can brush your pet's teeth, there is nothing better than brushing your pet's teeth. And people say, well, how often? Like once a month when I take them to the groomer and I would say, just kind of consider what would happen for you if you brushed your teeth once a month. Uh, it's really, it, it's a daily process or at least an every three to four times a week process if you're going to do it and, and be effective at doing it a once every four to six weeks, uh, you might as well, <laughs> you might as well just do something else with your time. Right. Um, and if you start as puppies, like almost any other behavioral thing, if you start with them even before they have their permanent teeth and you teach them that it's okay to have their mouth opened and do this little, what they would call manipulative procedure, mm -hmm. so much the better. Uh, yeah. And the catch 22, unfortunately, is for those of you who love little dogs, and we've had Westies and other little yeah, dogs, little for those of you who love little dogs, your catch-22 is those dogs are much less facial tolerant than the big dogs are. <laughs> they just don't. If you've ever tried to hold a Yorkie or a Chihuahua still by the face, you know, even if, even if they know you love them as your owner. For us as veterinarians, they try to amputate a few fingers when yes. you do that. But the little dogs require much more dental care than the big dogs yeah. do. And, and the catch-22 is they're less likely to accept it. So in those situations where you can't, mm -hmm. a good oral product, a good, not something that just says for tooth care because what they leave out is the adjective that says effective tooth care because yep. almost any, even dog food, any, any even wet <laughs> food probably could be called for tooth care. Yep. Um, but something that shows effectiveness uh, as a preventative and, and shows some backing behind it that uh, does indicate uh, that uh, it's going to reduce the plaque, that would be a good, well, I, want, I, I shouldn't use the word substitute, but you do what you can do. So if it takes four people to uh, each one to grab onto the dog's leg and then one person <laughs> to run the toothbrush and pretty quick the dog's just running from you all, all Call day. me. I'll help you. Yeah. I will help you guys. Call me. I would love to do it. A good challenge. I'm always up for a good challenge. <laughs> so that's, you know, I would say um, good oral products, good diet, um, the detoxification thing we've talked about. Uh, I know the company that we that, that you represent has a, a great product that way. I would say all of those are potential benefits to a pet uh, in the sense of not having to wait or at least trying not to wait until you're having you know 15 to 20 teeth taken out of your dog's <laughs> mouth. Right. And, uh, and, and I guess the follow-up, the final to that is when you do see dental calculus, understand that up under the gum, like, you know, your hygienist talks about you and I angle the toothbrush, get up under the gum. When you do see the calculus, a lot of people will say, well, okay, that's early. And, and in a certain sense, it probably is. But understand that there's been a lot going on under the gum that you cannot see before you see it out on the tooth. So... Very good. Try to uh, be perceptive of that. Try to step in, in in ways that you and your pet can negotiate how this is going to work. And I love again, that. You and your pet are going to negotiate how it's going to work. So, Start as a puppy. 
so th those those are things that I think again prevent not just the pain and the uh, loss of uh, tooth disease, but it's very very well proven, uh, and and we've had the research for years to suggest that poor oral health translates into poor heart valve disease or something called endocarditis or endocardiosis. Mm -hmm. uh, that the onslaught, the continuous insult to the body of toxic bacterial products and things like that through bad teeth in your liver, in your kidneys, uh, create a potential diabetic concern. A multitude of different things that you're, as a, a lover of your pet, going to be able to avoid if you're able to get some effective way to control oral health. Awesome. Awesome. So that we probably killed that one. Uh, we did. We smashed pro pro that prob one. Probably lost half of our audience just waiting for the next question. But <laughs> That's anyway, okay. It's, Oral it's, health is super important. Super important. So if you guys haven't already, hit the share button. We've got more questions and we're going to dive right in. Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. Okay. How often should a pet be seen by a vet? Well, there are two areas of life where the, uh, the importance of frequent visits, uh, you know, are certainly significant. One is early in life. Um, there's a, again, sometimes uh, we get the information from the neighbor about uh, how to vaccinate versus somebody else and I don't know how many, probably hundreds and hundreds if not thousands and thousands of pets that we have seen that ended up with parvovirus or distemper virus or other things because the perception was we wait till six months versus six weeks to start to vaccinate and the perception that the six-week vaccine should be all that we need because we don't understand that mom's colostrum is potent out to 12 weeks and if mom's colostrum was good quality and it's high quality colostrum then that killed the vaccine before the puppy ever got immunized so there's a definite difference between vaccination and immunization so for puppies uh, we should start the process at around six weeks and then see them about every three to four weeks for booster vaccines mm -hmm. until we get two sets of vaccines after 12 weeks and the reason two is important like you and I one initial vaccine brings the immune system up to a certain level that yeah. second one in three to four weeks will take us up to about a five to ten times uh, immune protection over the first one and so I, 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 I don't know how many owners have spent thousands and thousands of pet dollars with me and with everybody else in the pet industry based on not understanding that principle. And it's very important. It's very important. And they can be high risk um, to be able to take to dog parks and family houses and be around other dogs until they have the proper immunizations at a certain date. Um, so as let's talk at like maybe an older pet, an adult or a senior, okay. how often should they be seen? Okay. So good question in terms of the follow-up. So middle age, what shall we call it? young adult, young adult to middle age, like you and I, most of the time, if you've set the foundation of things and, and here we try to advocate, I guess one other thing, we try to advocate for looking deeper than just the oral exam because right. the pet can't tell us some stuff. So if we get baseline lab work and that's an owner decision, but if we get baseline lab work when they're young, we establish they're good. Well, they age at six to seven to one, depending on, on type of pet, uh, you know, Breed. maybe maybe even in the large ones like the Danes, maybe it's more like four to five to one. So you would like to see them, if you're going to do good preventative medicine, we're going to do it at least twice a year because there are some intranasal products that uh, you yep. about have to do twice a year yep. to get good immunity. The Bordetella, the Bordetella so, guys, if you're going to be at dog parks, get that Bordetella in every six months. So we should see at minimum twice a, a year. Mm -hmm. And then obviously if you've got a small dog, you're probably not going to go to eight, nine, ten before we do dental work. You're right. probably going to go to two to three to four to five. Yeah. So then a little more often for that. Uh, so it, it's, it's sort of breed specific in the young adult to something other than young adult phase. I guess I'll put it that way. I guess I'm something other than young adult <laughs> today at my age, but something, oh, something other than young adult. Uh, so you know, something other than young adult in a large breed dog like a Dane or a Kavas or something mm -hmm. like that's probably five to six. And then you start looking for the same things that you and I look for mm -hmm. at when we become 50s and 60s, you start looking for deterioration of right, systems. Right, and right. Again, in the sense of it's not quite prevention, but certainly if you see a little change, especially if you've done baseline lab work when they were younger and you see a small change, even if it's within normal, if it's a repeated small change, it tells you something is going on. Yeah, that, that, again, that, you can catch stuff early as a preventative by doing this. Yeah, and, and if we see it there, 
again, there's lots of dietary changes, lots of supplementation mm -hmm. changes, lots of other things that create a stabilization uh, of that abnormality that translates into a much better quality quantity of life and a much less expensive venture than waiting until you see the signs of right. organ disease and then trying to resurrect or support Solve that it. organ system when uh, when it's it's extremely damaged. All right, guys, you heard it. Get in there and get some preventative exams done ASAP. Um, question number three: Should I purchase pet insurance? Well, it's. That's a loaded question. Yeah, it, I know, it, it, it's a loaded it, it, it's, question. It's a tough question to answer. I would say that, well, I would say the absolutes are. The absolutes are, if you're going to do it, don't wait till they're a middle-aged dog to do it. Do it when they're puppies. Uh, just like you and I, if we're going to buy insurance, we buy it cheaper if we start younger and you lock in for yep. some good companies, <laughs> you lock in a price point that's better and you have actually even lock in an ability to subsidize some of these preventative medicine procedures at a point in time when we're not having to fix things. So I'd say the absolute is if you're inclined to do it at all, do it when your pet's young. Great. If, depending on the kind of pets you like, you pick a breed that uh, is highly likely to have significant problems, well, of course, the insurance company is going to know that too, but still, even more so. So if you love a Newfie, there probably is a Newfie out there that doesn't have hip dysplasia, but I don't know if I've ever seen one. <laughs> so if you, if you love a Newfie, if you love what's another high-risk breed of dog that just seems to have a lot of issues. Cedar, well, TPLOs. Yeah, yeah. Cedar is a lab, by the way. I call him Cedar, but he's an American lab. He's my baby. If you guys you guys know who he is, but he's prone to TPLOs, knee issues, mm -hmm. and hips and elbows. And, and, and the Goldens with the seizure problems and mm -hmm. some of the other things, the Boxers and the Bulldog types with the heart issues yep. and some of the other things. So if you like that type of dog, I would predict for you, your love is going to have a higher price tag on it than if you like other dogs. So, <laughs> but it's worth it. So those, those dogs, I would say probably a good pet insurance company and like veterinarians and like people who make nutritional products, there are some that probably aren't so good. So uh, if you wanted some recommendations, again, I feel somewhat inhibited to do it in a broadcast thing because it seems discretionary. Yes, but what I would do is say, uh, when we finish this, uh, you can you can reach out to me on uh, Facebook. Uh, I, you know, again, mm -hmm. Dr. Terry and Lucy or other things. I would be happy to share with you privately companies that I think would do a good job. I awesome. I, I really don't want to do that. No, we in, appreciate in, in, that in the sense of being Respectful. judgmental to uh, companies that wouldn't be on my list. No, that's that's awesome. We appreciate we appreciate it more than you know. Super appreciate it. Um, so number five, I love this question. I get this all the time. Elka, can you describe a normal pup's poop? So that's what I'm um, going to ask you today. I, I always use the Tootsie Roll, right? It should be firm, mm -hmm. soft, but what is your definition of a normal dog's poop? What should it look like when you pick it up? Well, I guess that's one way to evaluate it, but what should it look like anyway? I should have brought Tootsie um, Rolls. What was I thinking, I guys? Would, I would say that description is pretty good. <laughs> People have a lot of concern about color, and, and color is relative to a lot of things that are in the diet or the treats you're using or things like that. I don't really think there's a, well, some colors are bad. If it's really black and tarry looking, especially if it's thick and thick, and black and tarry looking, that's possibly an indication of intestinal bleeding because as the blood moves through the intestinal tract, it goes from red to black. Uh, obviously, if it's red and looks like blood, that's another reason to be concerned. <laughs> I would say generally, if the GI tract is functioning adequately, it should be formed. It should be a good log. It uh, doesn't have to be a rock hard log, but it should be formed. If it's slimy, mucousy, uh, extremely mucousy, and if it's custard consistency or well, more watery than that, well, that mm -hmm. suggests a problem. Yes. Did you guys hear that? So keep an eye on your dog's poop. It will tell you a lot. No matter if they're a puppy, an adult, or a senior, your dog's poop says a lot because they can't talk. I love it. Um, so this is another one that I get. Um, my dog is scooting on his butt. What causes this? Okay. Well, the common thought is that it's intestinal parasites. Uh, mm -hmm. People have this conception about pinworms that people get and the sense of um, lower urinary or, if you will, anal and rectal um, burning itching. Yes. I would say the most common, and, and certainly diarrhea that's protracted like you and I when you have diarrhea for mm -hmm. several days, it gets pretty uncomfortable yes. down there. And so straining, dragging the bottom, 
frequency of going. Most people will interpret that and they'll bring their pet in and say they're constipated because they're sitting there straining all the time. Well, no, they're straining just the same reason that you and I strain when it feels like there's a fire down there. Uh, that sensation causes that to happen. So most commonly the thing that causes pets to drag their bottom is anal glands that are full and irritated. And if we don't address that problem then they abscess and we've got to get a bunch of sensitive tissue back to normal again and clean up a bunch of contamination. So if you see your dog dragging its bottom you probably don't need to go to the store and buy a, a, an over-the-counter dewormer. You probably need to either have your groomer if they're good at doing it or your veterinarian empty the anal glands. Yeah. And there are some vet clinics that you can actually go in and have an anal gland procedure, like an expression done, without seeing the vet. You can actually have a technician do it. So call ahead of time to your yeah. vets, um, ask them about that. So that might be a great thing for, for that. Um, so this is kind of another loaded question. Um, let's, let's just put it as an average adult large breed dog. Um, how much exercise should I, get, should I be giving my dog? So let's just say average, an adult, medium so, to large breed dog? Well, I would say probably a, a good guideline for most people. Some people do far more than that because they're athletic on their own, but guidelines for people probably somewhere around 15 to 20 minutes of good vigorous exercise uh, at least three or four times a week. I would say generally for most dogs that probably is fairly adequate because they exercise a lot more than we do anyway. I mean, every place they go, uh, they're, they're walking or jogging or running somewhere. They don't tend to get in the car, uh, you know, for this and that, well, unless we take them. But they do a lot of interactive things uh, otherwise. So I would say at minimum, probably 15 to 20 minutes, three to four days a week. Uh, certainly more than that if you have a dog that's fit and conditioned for it and they need fit and condition just like you and I so you know if you've been going to the health club all winter long and you don't take your dog because you can't go to the <laughs> health club but now it's spring like this and you go out and you run a 5k well probably your pet shouldn't do that the first <laughs> week with you they should probably get warmed up to it the way you and I uh, that's get poor Cedar we better we better get out there Cedar and I <laughs> so that that's that's what I would recommend anyway. perfect I love that thank you um, so the next one, so it's getting hotter, right? It's getting hot here in Utah. Spring is upon us. I mean, even though we had snow last week, don't let it fool you, spring is here. And as the heat starts to rise, people tend to travel with their pets a little bit more. Um, people leave pets in the cars, which I'm sure you guys have seen it, as well as pets are out exercising at the dog parks. So how will a pet parent know if their pet is getting heat exhaustion um, or getting overheated and what should they do? Do you have any quick quick advice on that? Well, I guess, um, you know, first off, obviously they're wonderful athletes and they do a lot of great things, but they did not pick a good radiator system. Uh, you know, theirs is, is pretty impaired in comparison to us or the horses that are blessed with lots of sweat glands and lots of body surface with which to dissipate heat. The dogs don't have that. Yeah. They have the foot pads and the tongue and that's about it uh, for them in terms of panting. So first off, if your dog is just can't stop panting and or you're seeing a change in the normal pink gum color. First off, it will start to look more reddish, uh, you know, and then it will start to look purplish if they're having to ventilate so rapidly because again, if you consider how a dog and how most mammals have to ventilate, we're not nearly as efficient as the birds are. We inhale and exhale in the same system. So if you're doing a long uh, a respiratory draw, you're getting a lot of oxygen down, a lot of carbon dioxide up. If you're not, just like a little pump uh, that you would pump yeah. if you're pumping it too rapidly, you're just going like this and you're not really getting good gas exchange because you're too hot and you're trying so to get this cooling So the lungs aren't things. expanding then? Well, they're expanding, but you're not, you're not evacuating them. Okay. So they're keeping more hot air in because you're breathing so rapidly that it's just pushing up, pushing back, pushing up, pushing back. So you're not exhaling a lot of the carbon dioxide and a lot of the hot air. And the gum and then, color will really, right. you'll know, okay. The other thing, like you and I, when we get heat exhaustion, our body temperature goes up, but then some mechanism stops us from sweating. So if you see your dog, if your dog looks hot but their tongue looks dry rather than looks wet and slimy, that's a very good indication. If they start to become well, almost what I would call like tied up like you and I at the end of uh, exercise where our <laughs> muscles just don't work well. If yeah. they start to look like they're unsteady in, in the way they're walking and doing things, then you say, well, 
it could be a multitude of things if you've been out exercising. Maybe it's that we overexercise, but maybe it's that we're getting to that point of hyperthermia within okay. the muscles too. And obviously the, the first and most immediate thing is, you know, you cool them off and there is a worry about, or people worry about shock that way, but really truly if you've got stream water or whatever else, you take them, you soak them up, but then again be perceptive that they're going to have heat everywhere. So that water that's on their skin is going to turn to skin temperature pretty quickly so you can redo it. People use alcohol which I think you can do uh, safely but obviously you don't want it you know where they're they're going to absorb it much so yeah. armpit areas, ingual areas, uh, foot pads, foot pads are, are reasonable areas to use alcohol and the, the, the thought process is valid that it evaporates faster than water so which allows it to cool. So it so cools. Yeah. Put that in your emergency kit when you're out running. Put, get a little bottle of the rubbing alcohol hall with some with some pads put that in an emergency kit and that'll help you in an emergency situation at least buy some time if you have to go to the vet um, they can obviously take that get that temperature down quicker than not so thank you so much you're welcome um so i'm on the last question and i've got to plug in pottery because you know me that's what i do but i gave terry some samples dr terry and i'm very excited and you know pottery's discovered that you don't like to eat the same thing every day and neither do our pets right well, what did what did Lucy think about our paw pairings? Well, Lucy is, she's she eats high quality food. Uh, you know, uh, we 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 obviously do that. But she, there were periods of time where you know because she's such a I think intelligent, engaging dog. When we were busy and stuff, she would feel some stress and just wouldn't eat. Mm -hmm. And so we've had some trouble that way. And almost immediately when we started using, and we've got six or seven bottles of different stuff out there now. Uh, almost instantaneously we were able to use that in comparison to some of the other things that we were using and mm -hmm. her appetite was better and she didn't have that uh, you know fasting tummy upset thing that they get when they don't have enough food in their tummy and mm -hmm. she she's 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 uh, converted all of us uh, to to uh, to the to the, these particular products to these seasoning type things uh, I love the fact that they're all natural and that mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about uh, the concerns of preservatives and other synthetic type products and uh, said Lucy has done fantastically on them. Awesome. So if you guys want some samples and you want to try it out for your pets, you know, add variety to mealtime, comment samples in the comments and we'll reach out to you and make sure we get that to you. Dr. Terry, I am so thrilled that you allowed me to come into your facility, talk to you about some preventative questions, some of the most common things that I get. Um, we appreciate your time more than you guys, than you ever know. So um, we're signing off for now, but thank okay. you so much for coming and saying hello. Let us know if you have any other questions. You can find um, Dr. Terry. What's your page one more time? Uh, it's Dr. Terry and Lucy. <gasps> Dr. Terry and Lucy. I will also put a link in the comments. You can reach out to him, get um, anything that you might need, but super excited to have you here. So um, peace out like trout. Kiss all of your fur babies on the snout, and we will catch you later. Okay. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.